Well, hallelujah. The Lord is good. Can you say amen? amen? And his loving kindness endures forever to all of us. We are so thankful for that. Praise God in the name of Jesus. Glad you're here. Fall break for all the schools here in town. Uh, nobody, I hope nobody went to Florida, but uh, our Daisy came back. They closed her college down. She's upstairs working in the, in the, uh, with the uh, children's church. Amen. Praise God. Because she was at Palm Beach, you know, above Miami, the other side. But nonetheless, they closed the college down. And so she got ahead of all the traffic and everything. Got here late Monday evening, I think. Praise God. Anyway, we are glad you are here. We're glad you're with us online. And we are excited about getting into the Word of God together. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 6. Amen. Praise God. Matthew, the sixth chapter. I mentioned, I told this story recently, I think just as recent as last Wednesday night, but I want to tell it again for a particular purpose. Uh, several years ago, Margaret and I, we were at a, one of those Gatlinburg, Pigeonburg, Pigeonburg shows, you know. And so at one of the, uh, what did I say, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge. <laughs> Pigeon, what did I say? Pigeon, <laughs> Pigeon Forge. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and uh, at one of the performances, at the beginning of the show, one of the performers came out and he started cutting up with the crowd, you know, a little bit. Because he wants to loosen up the crowd and get everybody in a good mood, get everybody smiling before they actually do their, their performance. And so, uh, so just trying to break the ice, so to, so to speak, this man said, uh, uh, he said, I think I know what the problem is. He said, how many of you had to pay to get in here tonight? Well, everybody had to pay, you know. And so this man pointed to someone in the crowd. He pointed to a man, you know, he said, sir, if you don't let it go, it's going to ruin your whole night. <laughs> and so, uh, and thinking about that story, that got to me thinking along a certain lines. Uh, and that's why I retold the story. I want to talk to you about some things as a Christian you need to let go of. Things as a Christian you need to let go of. Because if you don't let go of it, it's going to ruin your whole day. Not only can it ruin your whole day, it can ruin your whole life. It really can, these things. Amen? If you don't let go of them. Amen? Certain things we want, we want to hold fast to our confession of faith, but there's other things we need to let go of. Praise God. So, what are some things that the Bible tells us as Christians to let go of? Well, number one, and you can't emphasize this enough. You just can't emphasize this enough. Amen? Is, uh, and let's, is, uh, is you need to let go of any sort of bitterness any sort of resentment, any sort of anger that you have toward anybody. Let go of any kind of unforgiveness, any kind of bitterness, any kind of resentment that you have toward anyone. And I know, you know, we, we teach on that a lot because it's so extremely important, but I want to come at it from a particular angle tonight, and, uh, and you'll see that in a moment. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 12, this is the Lord Jesus here. And he's, he's, this, is, this is found, this scripture is found, this is a part of what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. I think it might be better to call it the model prayer. Amen. But, in, but anyway, in this prayer, in verse number 12, Jesus said, And forgive us our debtors, as we, and forgive us our debts, rather, as we forgive our debtors. Verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, did Jesus say that? Yes. Amen. Let's turn over to Matthew 18. Like I said, I want to run some scriptures back to back here, especially some things Jesus said. Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse number 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You have to understand that rabbi, rabbi, Jewish rabbis, get my mouth straight tonight. <laughs> Jewish rabbis, they taught that you should forgive somebody three times. So Peter doubled that and added one, thought Jesus would pat him on the back. He says, how many times should I forgive somebody? Up to seven times? Amen. <laughs> and then Jesus said this, Glory to God. Verse 22. Jesus said to him, I say not, say, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And if you read that in other, you know, I forgot which gospel it is, but Luke's gospel, I think, it implies 70, 70 times 70 in one day. In other words, Jesus said you were to always forgive. 
Therefore, the kingdom of God is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to, to settle accounts, he was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, you all know, you're, you're all well taught in the Bible, but you know that's a lot, a lot of money. When I first saw that, I didn't know what that meant. And, but as I began to study that out, you know, I'm talking about way back in the 1970s, late 70s, I found out that, you know, one translation said $10 million. Another translation said uh, $20 million. I looked it up today and the, uh, the Passion translation says $1 billion. Because a talent was either 750 ounces of silver, one talent, or 750 ounces of gold. One talent, 750 ounces of gold times 10,000. Amen. The Amplified Bible, you know, says, says 10 million. The Amplified Classic, rather. But the Amplified Classic originally came out in the early 60s. So if you move that up in today's scale, that, that 10,000, they'd, they'd have to translate that, you know, huh, 100 million. I mean, they said 10 million, 100 million. But anyway, it, it, it's, a, it's an amount that the man could never repay. That's the most important thing we need to understand. This man owed a debt that he could never repay. Just like you and I as, as, as sinners were forgiven and we could never repay our sin debt. Jesus they did that for us. He freely forgave us. Can you say amen? amen? But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found a fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii. Well, a hundred denarii was, was one day's wage. So we're talking about thirty, forty, fifty, sixty dollars. Amen. I think the original Amplified Bible Classic said fifteen or twenty dollars, something like that. So and so so <laughs> you know, uh, and he said, "Pay me what you owe me." So his fellow servant fell down on his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that he had done. Then the master, after he had called him, said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all the debt was, that was due him. I mean, hate and unforgiveness will cause you to be tortured. I said hate and unforgiveness will cause you to be tortured. Amen. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories of people being tormented in one way or another because their testimony was because of unforgiveness. One man said the world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving spirit. If we refuse to forgive others, then we are only imprisoning ourselves and causing our own torment. Not only are we causing our own torment, but I'm convinced the scripture is alluding to the fact that, that the door will be open to the devil in your life and he will torment you and torture you and have a legal access into your life to steal, kill, and destroy. And that causes torment. Verse 35 though, I mean, we just read, you know, in Matthew chapter six, where Jesus said, if you do not forgive, Jesus said, if you do not forgive their trespasses, your heavenly father will not forgive you. Amen. And so here in verse number 45, 35 of chapter 18, Jesus said, so my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Well, Amen. And then as we're looking at these back to back, let's look at Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse number 22. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God for verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things, when you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have them and, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, anything against anyone, King James says if you have ought, ought means any little, any little thing, not just the great big things, but any little thing. You got to watch out, the Bible says, for the little foxes. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. 
So Jesus said, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Well, did Jesus say that? Amen. Luke chapter 6, verse number 37. Luke 6, 37. Judge not. Of course, we've talked about that many times. That means don't have a critical, condemning, judgmental spirit and attitude toward others. But judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Well, the implication is if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Isn't that right? Well, these are very serious and strong statements made by the Son of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Well, do they apply to us? And really, a lot of ministers and theologians struggle with these scriptures, but here's what you need to know and understand here. These passages are not talking about salvation. I said these passages are not talking about how you get saved, but about forgiveness between brothers and sisters in the body of Christ or the way a Christian should forgive. Amen. Salvation is given to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord as a matter of grace. Hallelujah. And Jesus is not teaching that believers earn forgiveness by forgiving others. That violates everything we know about grace. What he is saying is that if you as a child of God who's been forgiven of so much hold on to any sort of unforgiveness toward another person, then you are not in right fellowship with the Father. And then, and then uh, you're not in a position for God to be able to hear and answer your prayers because you're out of fellowship with him. Or you could even say it this way, as a Christian, you're not in right relationship with him. Now, as a Christian, I know that you're justified and righteous, but as a Christian, you've broken fellowship with the Father. You've got sin in your life. And this is really true of any sin, but Jesus particularly points out the sin of unforgiveness. And he said that will block you from receiving the forgiveness you need as a child of God. And then your prayers won't work and the doors open to the devil in your life. Amen. To move in and cause you some kind of problem. Amen. I said, amen. Second Corinthians chapter two, for you can read this in verses three through 11, but verse number 11 says, maybe you can put that up for us. Second Corinthians uh, two eleven. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 2.11. I'm sorry, I said three, but it's two. Now, in context, he's talking very specifically about forgiving somebody. And he said, if you don't forgive, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. A lot of people like to throw that scripture around. You know, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. If you're ignorant of the devil's devices, then he'll take advantage of you. But the specific, specific, in context, thing that he's talking about there is if you have unforgiveness in your heart, then the devil will take advantage of you. Are you listening to me? And so Andrew Womack in his commentary on this scripture says, basically any sin gives Satan an opening to our lives. Amen. However, however, the sin of unforgiveness is given special attention by the Lord Jesus and his half brother James, James 3.16. Satan can get an advantage over us if we operate in unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a luxury none of us can afford. Unforgiveness is not only detrimental to others, but it also delivers us over to the tormentors. And then he mentions Matthew 18, 35 and 35. Unforgiveness delivers us over to the tormentors. Amen. So Satan takes advantage of unforgiveness and it is one of the major ways the devil gets advantage over unbelievers. Glory to God. Amen. See, we're talking about, you know, Jesus said what he said and he meant what he said, but it doesn't have anything to do with salvation, but it very much has to do with whether or not you get your prayers answered, whether or not your faith's going to work, whether or not you're going to stay in right fellowship with the Father, and whether or not you keep the door closed on the devil. And so I'm reading from these different people. Here's, here's, here's Warren Wiersbe, Wiersbe. He says this about Mark 11:22. You know, 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. You know, he said this. He said, true prayer involves forgiveness as well as faith. I must be in fellowship with both my Father in heaven and my brethren on earth if God is to answer my prayers. 
He says, we do not earn God's blessings by forgiving one another. Our forgiving spirit is one evidence that our hearts are right with God and that we want to obey his will. And this makes it possible for the Father to hear us and to answer prayer. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. And Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. And then, you know, Brother Hagin always said this. He said, if my prayers weren't working, if my faith wasn't working, if I wasn't getting results, you know, then the very first thing I would do is check up on my love life. And I'd make sure I was walking in love toward others and then that I didn't have anything against anybody. And then I like something I, I read by Keith Moore. This was actually in Brother Copeland's magazine. But then Keith teaches on this, you know, and has some messages on it. But the, in Brother, the title of, the, of this article is, When God Won't Forgive. Well, we just read those scriptures, didn't we? Like I said, that most people kind of eh, don't know what to do something with. He said, I have a message about forgiveness, which I call when God won't forgive. And when I announced this title, most people in the congregation do what you may have done when you saw the title of the article. They sort of do a double take and either say out loud, God will always forgive. Or I can tell, I can tell from their faces they are thinking there's never a time when God won't forgive. But the Bible says there is a time when God won't forgive. Right after he described the prayer of faith in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus went on to say, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Is there a time when God won't forgive? Yes, as a Christian, as his child, when you won't forgive your brother or sister. And will unforgiveness interfere with the flow of healing and prosperity in your life? Yes, it will. And that, my brother, sister, is a very, very simple, serious matter. And then he tells a story, and I want to take some time here to read this. He says, let me give an example from my own experience from many years ago. I worked in healing school. He was the head of it at Kenneth Hagin Ministries. I remember one particular man I worked with. I mean, he was doing it. He wasn't the head of it, but, you know, he was, he was the main teacher for a long time there. I worked with, for months and months with a particular man without seeing any progress toward his healing. The man had the physical problem for years and was half dead most of the time. He was seeking healing, but he never seemed to get it. It wasn't because he hadn't heard the word on healing. He could quote as much scripture as I could on the subject, but he just didn't receive his healing. It troubled me that he wasn't making more progress because he should have been. So I went to the Lord in prayer about it. Please show me what's wrong, Lord. This man should be healed by now. He should have been healed a long time ago. Do you understand that if, if you go years and years without being healed, something is wrong? And of course, the difficulty is not with God. God has no purpose to serve by keeping you sick. People say, well, God is going to heal you, but not right now. No, no. God's will is that you receive Right now, the healing he provided for you a long time ago. Jesus paid for our healing long before we were ever born. Well, I got to talking with this man one day after service. He was a retired businessman. And I happened to make some, some remark about people doing you wrong in business. When I said that, this man began to tell me about an incident that happened 30 years ago. Apparently, this businessman had been badly hurt by someone who had done him wrong in business. They stole a lot of money from him and damaged his reputation, of, damaged the reputation of his business. There was no doubt the man had been seriously harmed. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was that he was telling me about it decades later, and the more he talked, the harder he got, the harder and edgier his words got. His face was set in a hard and angry expression, and though he didn't realize it, he was g going into a mad frenzy. I just stood there and let him talk, waiting to see how far he would go, and finally he was virtually ranting and raving against the person who had hurt him over 30 years ago. He actually got to the point where he said to me, if I had a gun, I would shoot that old so-and-so. Well, the Lord spoke up inside him and said, that's why. The reason this man wasn't healed was that he hadn't forgiven his person. He was still holding a grudge against him. That unforgiveness was blocking his healing. Amen. Amen. And of course, any sort of unforgiveness or resentment or anger towards another person will manifest in the way we treat others and in, the, and in the way we talk to them and in the way we talk about them. It'll manifest that way. We always just think about, you know, you, you got to keep unforgiveness out of your life. But you understand if, you're, if you 
talk bad about people and you're critical of other people and you, have a, and you condemn other people, then that's not walking in love. And that was also everything we've said would fall under that same realm. Now, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little story here that just happened. There's a, there's a church near me. Now, see, you don't know what church I'm talking about. But there's a church near me. And, and back during COVID, you know, uh, you know all the government interference and all the goofy things they did. I know some people were just trying to save lives and help, but, you know, there was a lot of silliness and goofiness, and y you know all of that. You know all of that. And so this church was, was one of the very, very first ones to close down. I mean, we're trying to believe God and, and believe God for healing and get back going. And if you had COVID, you overcame it. It didn't kill you. So, you know, you, you overcame. Praise God. Somebody said, do you ever have it? Well, if I did, I don't know it. I, I might have, but if I did, I don't know it. I took three or four COVID tests at various times, but, uh, and they, they always came out negative. And a couple of times I had some symptoms and maybe I didn't take a test, but if I had it, I don't know it. But anyway, you know, we, we, we talk about you'll be protected, but you were protected. You overcame it. Thank God for that. But anyway, this church was one of the first ones to close down. They closed down a lot, lot longer. I'm talking about two months longer than any other church. And then on top of that, uh, you know, there's another, they, came, they opened back up and then there was another little, little scare. And this is, this is way down the line. And, and, and after two weeks, they closed down again and didn't open up for a long, long time. And so every day I ride by that church and their sign says, well, we, we have, we, we've closed down, you know, they finally opened back up. But it, even today on October the 9th, 2024, you ride by that church and they say, we are still practicing social distance. We do not have Sunday school classes. We hope to open soon. We hand out masks at the front door and, and so forth and so on. And it just ticks me off. <laughs> Besides, the name of their church is a church that the, the denomination as a whole is very liberal. You know, they're, they're into the LGBTQ. They're into the, you know, ordaining homo, the, the whole bit. And like, it just ticks me off. <laughs> and so I happened to have somebody in the car with me the other day, and we rode by that church. So I rehearsed to them all that I just said to you. <laughs> but in a very critical, condemning manner. You know, this stupid church, they're out there, they're doing this. And, you know, of course, in the natural, they, you know, they were like, yeah, this is crazy. I mean, what, they're still, they're right there in front of me. It says, we, we hope to open back up soon, you know, and uh, our Sunday school and so forth and so on. Amen. <laughs> a lot of things I could say, but I think you understand what I'm talking about. Well, you know, just a couple of days after that, I, I started developing some, some symptoms uh, now, they weren't any symptoms. I mean, if I was standing there talking to you, I, you wouldn't have saw them because I didn't, I, I didn't, have, a, I didn't have a nasal congestion. I wasn't stuffed up. I, 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 didn't, I wasn't coughing. My throat didn't hurt. But, but every six or seven hours, it seemed like my head would just explode, which is unusual for me. As far as I know, I've never had a headache in my life. I've had a couple of caffeine withdrawals, but I've never had a headache in my life. <laughs> never. And, uh, uh, you know, and... Uh, uh, and it, but I felt feverish and achy and then it'd kind of go away and n nothing major. It went over a couple of times. Now, this may not be true in your situation, but in, in this particular situation, I seem to have an indirect impression that from the Lord that, that, that this was going on in my life because I'd opened up the door to the devil because I'd spewed out all of that critical judgmental feelings about this church and their signs. Now, in the first place, I, I don't know what this church believes or doesn't believe. Maybe their sign is just because they're too lazy to go out there and change it. I, I, you know, some, sometimes you look at somebody's website and it, it, you know, the last thing they posted was January 2022. And you're going, you know what I'm saying? But, but I don't think so in this case. But nonetheless, nonetheless. And, uh, and, and I just sense in this case, it was directly connected to those words I had spoke, spoken. Amen. God deals with people in different ways, you know. And, uh, and I, the Lord's been showing me this for years and years and years and years. So I repented and all those symptoms disappeared. Glory to God. Amen. Now listen, I'm thoroughly convinced. I'm thoroughly convinced that sometimes people are going through some sort of hardship. Now we all know and understand that we live in this world. Jesus said in this world, you shall have tribulation. We all know, you know, God said, I will be with you in trouble. We all know the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. 
So just because somebody's tested or tried or tempted in any area doesn't mean they've done anything wrong and you have to use your faith and no matter how much love you walk in, if you don't know how to resist the devil and use your faith and so forth, the devil will take advantage of you. We all know that. But, on, but nonetheless, I'm thoroughly convinced that sometimes people are going through some sort of hardship and in reality are not overcoming. Now listen to what, what I'm saying here. In reality, they're not overcoming. What I mean by that is their doctrine is, I believe in living a victorious, overcoming life because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And you could tie me to the stake and I would never change my mind. I believe you should live a victorious, overcoming life. That's their doctrine. That's what they believe in their minds. That's what they believe in their hearts. And they would never, you could never talk them out of that truth. But in everyday reality, they're dealing with something and they're not overcoming it. Are you following what I'm saying? And I believe in those cases, I'm firmly convinced in those cases that, 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 that a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times the problem is the door has been opened to the devil and he has a legal right to attack people and that is directly connected sometimes to the fact that they've got unforgiveness in their heart or to the words that they have spoken two days ago, three days ago, three weeks ago, three months ago, but they don't make the connection. They don't make the connection at all. They just, I'm resisting the devil. Or look what the devil's trying to do to me. He ain't trying to do it to you. He is doing it to you because he's got a legal access into your life and you can rebuke him all you want to, but he ain't going nowhere until you, you know, Repent. Are you listening to me? Amen. See, people don't, I hope you understand what I'm saying. People sometimes don't make the connection that the reason they're not overcoming is directly related to unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, or hard feelings they have towards somebody, or for the judgmental, condemning, critical words that they have spoken against somebody in the past. Are you following me? So we should all in reality, everybody say in reality. Yeah. We're talking about things a Christian should let go of. Here's the number one thing you should let go of. Let go of any kind of hard feelings or anger you have against anybody. I said let go in reality, not just say, well, I agree with that. That's a good doctrine. I know that's the truth. No, in reality, let go of any sort of hard feelings or anger that you have toward anybody and make sure that you don't allow any critical judgmental words to ever come out of your mouth. No, oh, come on, Pastor Mark, ever? I mean, ever? Do you ever play with rattlesnakes? Do you ever drink gasoline? So that's not really that hard to do, is it? And you have to watch out for the little things. You know, so I usually stay at home all day long. You don't see anybody, but like Margaret and I on our trip, you know, on the motorcycle trip or any day for me because I'm out and about. But, you know, you're, you're dealing with people at the gas station. You're dealing with the waiter. You're dealing with the waitress. You're dealing with the banker. You're dealing with the hotel people. You're dealing with people that you interact with just all day long. And if you're not careful, somebody's going to come along and tick you off. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you're not doing it. They're just going to say something stupid to you. They're going to offend you in some way. They're, they're not going to be helpful to you. They're actually going to, you know, be 100% wrong and, and still just, just, you know, and you have, to be, you have to be careful that you just don't say, ah, 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 and then walk away from it and just forget all about it. But not realizing that that can come back to, to hurt you. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. See, the Bible says again, the little fox, it's the little foxes. It's the little foxes that cause great, great problems for you and hinder your prayers and hinder your faith. Amen. And give Satan access into your life. Somebody said, no, 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 this, this is just too much. I mean, I mean, never be critical or judgmental. Always watch my words. Never get offended at people that I interact with. I mean, at the grocery store, I mean, just, I mean, I say little things to people at the, the person at the counter and they don't help me and they're, ah. no, never do that. Never do that. Amen. And no, it's not too hard. Like I said, you never drink gasoline. You never play with rattlesnakes. Yeah, but I don't have opportunities to play with rattlesnakes several times a day. Well, if you did, would you play with them? <laughs> of course not. But okay, I get your point. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't have to deal with that all the time. But how about this? You drive all the time. Do you drive with your eyes closed? 
No, you don't ever do that, do you? I mean, if you get sleepy, you, you, what do you, you <laughs> pull over. Avoid it at all costs because people die if they go to sleep at the wheel. And you know that. So you take that very seriously. Isn't that right? I said, isn't that right? Lord of God, do you ever get out there and just say, oh, it'd just be fun to drive over here on the wrong side of the road? Do you ever do that? Do you ever just drive on the wrong side of the road? No. And you drive all the time, so you, you don't have to drive on the wrong side of the road. You, you pay attention. Amen. Praise God. I mean, do you, do, you, do, you, do you just run through stop signs? I mean, I'm not talking about just a rolling stop where you don't make a complete stop. You're supposed to make a complete stop. But I'm talking about, do you just ignore stop signs and run through them at 30 and 40 miles an hour? You ever ran through a stop sign that you didn't know was there and you got through it and you realized, oh my God, I mean, it almost shakes you up, doesn't you? Like, Phew. if a car would have been coming the other way, they wouldn't have stopped and I'd have just, I mean, it shakes you up. Cause you, it, do you, but, but, but you just roll through seven out of 10 of them or? You know, just ignore, ignore them. Everywhere. No, you know, you don't ever run. If you know a stop sign's there, you stop. Why? Because it's dangerous if you don't stop. Of course it is. Amen. In the natural, you, you look before you leap. You don't allow your kids to get next to the mountain cliff where you can fall off. Because people, every year, we'll read about two or three people that fell off and were severely injured or died. And so you, do, you don't ever do that. You always look before you leap. But in the natural, financially, and in other ways, See, we must recognize how costly and deadly not, going off, not letting go of offenses is. And we must recognize how deadly critical judgmental words spoken against others is. We must recognize that. We must recognize that. We must recognize that and not do it any more than we would play with rattlesnakes. Amen. I said amen. I got to thinking about that today as I was looking at my phone while I was driving. And I was thinking, you know, I think unforgiveness and speaking critical words of others is kind of like being on your phone. We don't recognize how dangerous that is. But every day, people have wrecks because they're doing that. Every day, somebody dies because they were doing that. Every day, people get tickets because they're doing that. <laughs> don't they, Lieutenant Graham? <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> are you understanding what I'm saying? I said, are you understanding what I'm saying? Praise God. Glory to God. And, and so, so we must not. We must not. We must not. I, I thought, you know, I, I thought I was going to give you four or five things tonight, and maybe we'll get to them beginning next Wednesday night. But as I went along today, I said, no, I'm just going to talk about this one thing. I want, to, I want to go on reading this article from Keith Moore because I think it would help us immensely here. Because a lot of people struggle with forgiveness. You know, somebody said, everybody thinks it's a good idea to forgive until they have to forgive. <laughs> It's a, we, find, we discover, somebody else said, it's a whole lot easier to, to talk about forgiveness than to actually forgive. Yeah. You know, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Well, turn the other cheek means somebody's done you wrong, somebody's done you dirty, somebody's talking bad about you, and we forget that that hurts. You know, if somebody slaps you, it hurts. To turn the other cheek is to, to not respond in kind. Don't return critical words for critical words, as Peter said. Unkind word for unkind words. You know, blow for blow. Glory to God. Amen. And so he said, you may be thinking, Brother Keith says this, I've tried to forgive certain people who've wronged me, but every time I try to forgive, I get to thinking about what they did, about how wrong and hurtful it was, and I just get so mad I can't see straight. And then I feel bad because I haven't forgiven them. A lot of Christians struggle that way. Well, that's an honest statement of how people feel, but it shows they don't understand how forgiveness works. Forgiveness is not based on feelings. Everybody say, forgiveness is not based on feelings. Actually, forgiveness has nothing to do with your feelings. You see, if you're hung up on feelings, then you're going to struggle with forgiveness. You know, Jesus commanded us to love one another. Do you always feel like loving everybody? Well, then, then, then love is not just a feeling. Or an emotion. So you can do it apart from your feelings. Same thing here. You'll think because you still feel upset sometimes about something someone did to you, you haven't really forgiven them. Or you'll think you haven't been forgiven for something you did because you don't feel forgiven. Forgiveness is about letting go of things in the past and moving forward. Jesus taught that forgiveness of sins and forgiveness of transgressions against others are comparable to forgiveness of debt. I say debt. 
I hold that in your thinking. We'll get back to that in a minute because I want you to, he, he gives a little illustration here that I think will help you tremendously. But I want to go back to something. You know, you know, sometimes I talk about, we talk about, you know, what Jesus said. And when you realize what he's saying, you know, then you realize how significant this is, how important this is. And we've all heard, heard stories about people that after they forgave, then, then they got healed. Or after they forgave, their prayers started working. After they forgave, they were loose from the tormenting prison they were in and so forth. And so sometimes I tell the story about the lady that had, she suffered, everybody say suffered, suffered, suffered with chronic stomach problems for years. And so long story short, you know, she went to Brother Hagin's meetings as she was listening to Brother Hagin preach. He talked about, you know, you got to walk in forgiveness or your faith's not going to work. Amen. And so she went back to her room and said, I see what I've got to do. I've got to forgive my brother because I haven't talked to him in over 20 plus years. Didn't even know how to get in contact with him. Didn't even have his phone number. But she got around that afternoon, looked up his phone number and so forth, called him on the phone and they, and they talked and they forgave one another and, you know, and uh, agreed to meet one another and got all that straight and so forth. And then, you know, Brother Hagin had said, listen, if you can be here for the meeting all week long, don't just come up the first night, L get some word in you. Listen to what I teach on and, and, and build yourself up in faith. Then come Friday night and, and to the prayer line and I'll lay, lay hands on you. But that lady, because this is about the middle of the week, you know, about Wednesday, she, she, after she had forgiven her brother, she, she was going to lay down and take a nap before the night meeting. You know, you do that sometimes when you're at these meetings going morning and noon and so forth. And, and she's going to take a nap. And so she said, she, as she was taking her nap, she said, I don't believe I'll wait till Friday night. I believe that, uh, that unforgiveness I know was, was hindering me from getting my healing all these years. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the prayer line tonight. Glory to God and receive my healing. So she took her nap. But when she got up from her nap, she was 100% healed from head to toe and didn't need anybody to lay hands on her. Now, here's the point I wanted to make to you. <laughs> if she would have known, see, I said people don't make the connection. If she would have realized, because she's been suffering for this for years and years and years. If she would have realized years before this that the reason she was having those stomach problems was because of the unforgiveness she held toward her brother, you think she would have done something about it. Yeah, yeah. See, she wasn't making that connection. And, and people, over the years, people have started to make the connection a little bit, or maybe to a great deal even in some cases, between unforgiveness and blocking the power of God. That's what Pat Robertson, you know, they asked him, said, what's, what's, the, what's the greatest block to the power of God you know of? And he instantly said, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. So people make that connection, but people are not making the connection that critical, unkind, judgmental words spoken to somebody or about somebody also causes that, blocks the power of God. Because that's the part of not walking in love, and faith walks by love. So if she had realized that all them years later, she'd have done something about it. Because when she, when she realized it, she did something about it. So, so brother, brother Keith said, talked about debt. Now listen to this, debt. Everybody say debt. Do you remember the story of the debtor in Matthew 18? I hope so, because we just read it. <laughs> if not, we'll lay hands on you. <laughs> the man owed the king a multi-million dollar debt. And when he was called to account, he begged. Just have patience with me. Give me time and I'll pay it back. It's questionable whether he would have paid it back or, or would have been able to pay it back. But the Lord had mercy on him and forgave him the debt. The king just didn't give him time to pay his debt. He forgave the entire debt. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So now the debtor was a free man. A few months before, he owed 10 millions of dollars. Now he owes nothing. But he didn't understand forgiveness. He went right out and found a fellow servant who owed him a few dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded, pay me the $10 you owe me right now. And his fellow servant said the same thing the former debtor had said to his Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. But instead of forgiving the debtor as his Lord had done, he would not, he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. When his Lord found out what this former debtor had done, he became very angry. He called the man back and said, oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me to. Should not have you done the same thing and had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Did you notice what happened? This man's previous huge, huge debt was reinstated. Hmm. He was once again responsible for a debt he had been forgiven. And not only that, he was delivered over to the tormentors until he could pay. Jesus 
summoned up the situation, summed up the situation with these words, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brothers. When won't God forgive? When you won't forgive others. Boy, that's serious. When are you not forgiven? When you are not forgiven, you're under condemnation. And if you're under condemnation, you have no confidence. Your faith won't work. You are dull and insensitive. Unforgiveness messes up your spiritual life. Now, here's what I really want you to get. Please pay attention. Understand that forgiveness is like releasing a debt has helped, understanding that has helped me tremendously in walking in love and forgiving because it helps me separate my human feelings from the act of forgiveness. Dealing with feelings is important because we're all human and it's natural to have hurt feelings when somebody does something to hurt you and don't think you can get away with pretending it doesn't bother you. If someone does something that really hurts you, really harms you, you're going to be tempted to hold a grudge. And if it's something that keeps upsetting you, well, every time it upsets you, you're going to be tempted. But you don't have to yield to the temptation. The best way, listen carefully, the best way I've found to resist the temptation to hold on to hurts and injuries is to remember that Jesus compared, Jesus compared forgiving and releasing a debt someone owes me. When I forgive someone, I release them from a debt. Say that. When I forgive somebody, I release them from a debt. Forgive us our debts. Remember, we read that when we started. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For instance, if someone owed you money, you might say, all right, when are you going to pay me that $10,000 you owe me? They might say to you, I'm having financial trouble right now, but I'm going to pay you just whenever I can. Well, listen, you might reply, the Lord has dealt with me to forgive you this debt. Here's the note, here's the paper that says you owe me $10,000, but I'm just tearing it up. From this moment forward, from this moment on, you do not owe me the money. You are released from the debt. If somebody is truly released from the debt, you owe me nothing. I mean, even if you pay the debt, like, like you pay your house off, then the bank says, you owe me nothing. They don't call you the next month and say, why didn't you make that monthly payment? You owe me nothing. You owe me nothing. Isn't that right? If the debt has been released or paid, then you owe them nothing. That's exactly the way forgiveness of sin is. And it's, now, and it's not based on how you feel. If someone has hurt you or transgressed against you, it's natural to feel they owe me restitution. They owe me reconciliation. Have you ever, how about this one? They owe me an apology. I forgive them, but they owe me an apology. But if you forgive them, you release them from this debt. In a sense, you tear up the paperwork. Then any time the remembrance of this incident comes up, any time feelings arise about it, you just say, they owe me nothing. I tore up the paperwork. That becomes your stance no matter how you feel. I don't care how I feel. They don't owe me anything. You see, forgiveness operates by faith regardless of feelings. If you take a stand of faith, then every time you are tempted to remember the hurt and get upset, you hold fast on your confession and say, no, 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 they don't owe me anything, not even an apology. They don't owe me anything. They don't owe me anything. Not even an apology. Before long, your heart will begin to agree with your mouth. You'll begin to feel free. Amen. You'll know no one owes you anything. You'll know you have to, you know, you'll know you have to let go of the hurt and by faith have, you'll know you have let go of the hurt and by faith have really forgiven them, forgiven those who have trespassed against you. And when you have truly forgiven your debtors for what they feel they owe you, for what you feel they owe you, God can forgive your debts and your trespasses against him and against your brothers and sisters, then there's no hindrance to the flow of God's power in your life in any area. Amen. They owe me nothing. They owe me nothing. Glory to God. When I first saw that scripture, you know, Matthew 18, you know, not knowing what I know today, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this one. I said, you mean to tell me somebody owes them millions and millions and millions of dollars? And you, you, I mean, you're telling this to make a point, to give an illustration. And you know, you, your story ought to be a good one to make your point. But Lord, this doesn't seem, this doesn't seem like a good story to me. <laughs> 
You're mean to tell me somebody owes $100 million and they go out and find somebody that owes them $20 and they throw them in prison when they've just been forgiven $100 million? I said, I don't get that. I mean, I, I know I'm missing something here, but that, that, that doesn't seem like a really good point to be making here, Lord. And then I saw it. You're the one that's being forgiven the $100 million debt. You're the one that has been forgiven of all your sins. You owed a debt you could never owe. And for you to go out and hold anything against anybody else in comparison to what I have done for you is just a little insignificant nothing. Amen. Stand up with me. Praise God. So close your eyes. Got anything going on in your life with anybody? Whether it's just the last three or four days, close your eyes. Just the last three or four days or Maybe it was three or four years ago. Maybe it was 30 years ago. And, and it just keeps coming to your mind, keep coming to your mind. Just, just, every, let's all say, so now I forgive them. They owe me nothing. They don't owe me any restitution. They don't owe me an apology. They owe me nothing. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll say it, and I'm going to keep on saying it. I say it to myself first, and I say it to you. Watch your words. Watch your words. Don't ever go out and drive with your eyes closed. And don't ever speak critical, judgmental, condemning words against somebody else. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Now, that doesn't mean they're not wrong. That doesn't mean, you know, you, 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 just because you let them off your hook don't mean they're off God's hook. But that's none of your business. That's between them and the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed. Thank you, Lord Jesus.